Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author, Danielle Girard, and my guest today is B.A. Paris. Bernadette is the New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author of seven novels, including the word of mouth hit Behind Closed Doors and her upcoming thriller, The Guest. Over 7 million editions of her work have been sold worldwide, and her books have been translated into 41 languages. Three of her novels have been optioned for major screen adaptations with a film of the breakdown titled Blackwater Lane in post-production. Before becoming an author, Bernadette, who spent most of her life, adult life living in France, worked in finance as a trader before retraining as an English teacher. She and her husband then ran a language school together whilst bringing up their five daughters. Today, she writes from her cottage in Hampshire, England. Welcome, Bernadette. Thank you for having me on, Danielle. It's, and I, thank you for the introduction. It doesn't sound like me at all. It, it, it's quite impressive. It sounds to me, I mean, it sounds to me like you've had an incredible life. And you're so, you know, your books are so well regarded, so successful. And the, the guest is going to be no... Um, no difference from that. It was a, such a fun read. So before we get into all of the fun things, can you tell our listeners about the guest? Yes, of course. So um, Iris and Gabriel have just come back from a holiday where Iris had hoped that Gabriel would open up to her about a recent trauma that he's had, but he didn't. So she's feeling slightly frustrated and she gets back home and she finds that Law, their French friend, has moved into their house while they were away. And it's not as creepy as it sounds because they have the keys to each other's house and they're very happy to help her out. She's very distraught. She says that she's just found out that her husband, Pierre, has fathered a child with somebody else and they don't have any children themselves. So this is a huge blow to her. And the trouble is she kind of starts overstaying her welcome and she interferes a lot by moving things around in the house and wearing Iris's clothes and kind of to get away from this oppressive atmosphere. Iris makes friends with a new couple that have come into the village, um, Hugh and Esme, but they have their own cuckoo in the nest, their gardener Joseph, and uh, really the book centres around the relationship between these six people, and of course, because it's a thriller, there are quite murderous um, circumstances. <laughs> quite murderous circumstances, for sure. Well, you are you are famous for your twists and you know, your unexpected endings. And, um, and this is, of course, no different. So I have to ask, though, you know, are you somebody who sort of plots it all out? How do these, you know, how do these things happen for you? I, I'm not a plotter. Um, I always know how my story is going to start. I think about my opening scene. And I know the end. So I know the characters, not very well, but I know who the character is going to be. And I know how I want my book to end. So really, it's just working towards that. And I don't really know. Of course, I've been thinking about it in my head. So I'll kind of have ideas about where the story might be going. But I'm always surprised at where the story actually does go, because it's never really where I think it is. Because as you get to know your characters, they begin to act on their own. Or, you know, you think, well, like, actually, this character has turned out a little bit differently to how I imagined. So I can make them do this. And I just find it a fascinating process. I have tried to plot because I think that's probably an easier way to go because when you don't, it means that you have quite a lot of editing to do, but I just can't do it. I just have to go with the flow and see where the story takes me. And that's been true for you for all your books, I, I assume. It's sort of the way it's worked for you. Yes, absolutely. I, that's just the way I do it. I start my first chapter and then yeah, I'm always fascinated to see what ha what's happening in chapter 10 that I never thought about, you know. So. Exactly. Well, and like, you know, in all your books, you had the, the relationships are at the center. And um, and of course, the, the idea is that all of us, which is true in real life, have something that we're holding back, right? Some piece of us that we don't share. And in the case of, you know, Gabriel, he has witnessed this uh, young boy die at the bottom of this um you know, ravine, and you know, and he's a doctor, so of course he feels responsible for not having been able to save him. And I love the way that you know that is, you know, he's dealing with, of course, their daughter is grown and gone. It's all these things we actually experience in real life, and in of course non-murderous ways, thankfully. And it um, and it becomes this 
this sort of, you know, thing inside him that once he sort of doesn't open up about it immediately, of course, it takes seed and it's harder and harder mm -hmm. to sort of admit um, to, you know, what happened and how he feels about it. So it feels quite real. I mean, that's that's a lovely thing. And maybe, and maybe that comes from following your character sort of organically. What would, you know, what would this, you know, what would Gabriel do? What would, you know, what would each of them sort of do? And and anyway, so fun. So I want to talk about your background because I, you know, you're, you're, you know, you, we read so much about, you know, attorneys who become writers and, you know, the, a do, an occasional doctor, but less, less often traders and people in finance. Now I spent almost a decade in finance too, which is sort of an interesting, um, you know, background, but so can you tell us what led you from, you know, trading to sort of retraining in English? It's, that's, it's quite a leap. It is quite a leap, but I think, you know, at the time I left finance when um, I was pregnant with my first daughter, or was it my second one? I did go back, back briefly after my second daughter, I think, you know, it's hard to remember. But, you know, I wanted something that fitted around um, my children. So actually I gave up work um, and for about how many years, maybe 10 years, I was a stay at home mum. Mm -hmm. And I only went back to work when my youngest daughter was three because they go to school at three in France. And when I wanted to go back to work, I didn't want to go back into finance. So um, I just thought, well, I'm going to retrain as something else. And, and I was already giving English lessons to friends' children who were saying, oh, could you help my daughter with her English and everything? Mm -hmm. So um, I decided the easiest thing to do would be to train as an English teacher because I could always find work and, um, and that would fit around my children because I could take them school, to school in the morning, go and teach and then come home and pick them up and everything. So everything was always centered around my children. I wanted to be there to take them to school and to pick them up in the evenings. And often they came home for lunch as well because they do that in France. So, you know, it's quite a, it's quite a full on day. And yeah. so, yes, so I became a teacher because it just fitted in with the lifestyle that I wanted at that time. And I love that you have five daughters. Yeah, I think if I'd had <laughs> 10, they would have all been daughters. Maybe I just I mean every voice. That is so funny. Well, there is some statistic. I know my dad was an OBGYN. He would say that by the time you've had three of the same gender, the chances that the fourth will be a different gender is like 6%. So there is something about, I don't know what it is, but, but five daughters, you know, that is, that's amazing. So there's, this is another thing I want, you know, since we're killer women, I like to explore sort of the female aspects of this. And you're, you have very strong female characters in all the books. I mean, starting from, you know, behind closed doors, which of course, um, you know, that woman, we won't talk about her, but that's a book. If you have not read, if you haven't started with BA Paris from the very beginning, you need to go back. Um, but that is, you know, women who have, you know, have, have been in difficult, difficult circumstances with often in that situation, of course, a very, very difficult man. And yet they, you know, she, you know, rises to sort of, um, overcome, shall we say. And, you know, so I wonder about that with your, with your daughters, you know, is, do you find yourself sort of, you know, what is what is it you want your daughters to pull from your books? Obviously not murder, of course. None of us want our children to pull that. But, you know, do you find yourself thinking about, you know, sort of your daughters in this in this sense of these strong women? And was that, I think, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think my daughters do influence the way I write my female characters because I have brought them up to be strong women, to, to stand up for themselves. And some do it more than others. But, you know, I, I like them to be aware that, you know, they... They can do what they want, um, you know, as long as they go the right way about it. And they are quite strong characters. And I think that and I really do want my women characters to win through in the end. You know, I just think that's a really important message to give to my daughters, that even in the most difficult circumstances, you know, you can win through. You just have to be determined. And it comes to, you know, whether it's a job or whether it's your life or whether it's your marriage or whatever. So, you know, that's what I hope they take away from my books. They don't always read all of them because sometimes they're very busy young young girls but um you know some of them do so that's fine that's lovely well i love that idea i mean five daughters that is a that is a lot of daughters so when you so you said you you and your husband started a language school in france so you mean you you taught tell us about that that's really interesting too yes um i was teaching so i started teaching in a local school and at the local university and I was getting more and more work. And my husband at that point, it must have been 2007, he decided to leave the world of finance as well because it had changed so much and he was working such long hours. He had always traveled a lot. So he was rarely at home. And actually the three older children say they don't really remember him being at home when they were growing up, when they were yeah. young. 
And um, so when he decided to, to leave finance, I thought, well, great idea. You'll be at home for a while and it'll be easier. You know, it'll take some pressure off me. And that's actually when I started writing because I suddenly found that with him there, I had a little bit more time on my hands. He would take the children to school. And he had taken um, a few months off to think about what he wanted to do next. And meanwhile, I was getting more and more requests for teaching and a lot of business English as well. And so we decided, why don't we, you know, teach business English as well? So we set up our language school and then we'd go into Paris two days a week to teach English. And, uh, you know, so and it, well, he used to go in most days and I would go in two days a week. Um, and so, yeah, so we just um, and it was so much nicer working for ourselves. Yes. And working together in a way. So. I bet that was lovely. Well, that's incredible. Well, so now you mentioned in your, I also from your bio, there's sounds like there's a, an upcoming thriller from one of your books that's actually in post-production. That's getting yeah. pretty close. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that was really exciting. Um, so yes, it's my second book, actually, not the first one, which was optioned for film straight away, but it was it's the second book. Um, so I was quite surprised when that was optioned, but I was lucky enough to go and see it in production in England. And that was just the most amazing experience because although I know that a lot of my book or some of my book won't be in the film and there'll be things in the film that aren't in my book, the two times I went on set, it was actually, and that was just by chance, it was really two scenes from my book. And to actually hear the actors and actresses speaking the words that I wrote because they don't change them. It's, it was absolutely incredible. And just to see, the characters come to life um it, it was really amazing and it's really exciting and yeah i'm just waiting to hear more news about when it might come out and if it's going to be um on screen on the big screen or whether it's going to be you know on maybe on um, a streaming channel i don't know so i'm waiting to hear more about it these things always take a long time but it's yes. really exciting why well, I, I it, that is so exciting and that was a wonderful book but you're right i do i mean i i think you know when i read your first book i thought oh I this will be on screen. So I imagine there, there's people still working on that as well. But what an exciting yeah. process. And and there are times when, you know, authors feel like the book has changed so much that it's really hard. So it's lovely that they your, their vision sort of, you know, really aligns with your vision of the book. Mm. And I think, you know, I haven't seen the whole film, of course. So I'm sure I'll be saying, oh, that's not in my book. And right. but, you know, I just think to have a, your, your book made into a film is just something quite remarkable, something that I didn't even dream of. It never occurred to me that this could happen. So, you know, and the actors and actresses are wonderful and I'm sure they'll do a really good job. And I just can't wait to see it. Of course, of course, so exciting. And I think that's right, you just suddenly, cause you're, I think when you write, I don't know about you, but when you write it, it is a visual process in your head, right? But then to see it done by somebody, you know, in actual, visually is really is really really exciting so mm. that is so fabulous um so tell us you know so do you structure now that you're sort of your children are grown um i assume how does your how does the process how is it different for you there's obviously more time but you're quite busy now you've got a you've got a book coming out and you're i'm sure working on another book so do you have a how do you structure your days oh you know it's I think, do I have more time? I'm not sure I have more time now that they've left home because <laughs> we moved back to England to be, we were here to be nearer my parents who are quite elderly. And um, that was five years ago. My father, who's going to be hundred is still alive. So he's, he, you know, I do visit him quite regularly. And although my daughters have all left home, actually, no, we've just had to, they have never really let, they do leave, but then they might come back because they're in between flats or in between partners or something. So mm. it's really rare that we have nobody living with us. And in fact, one of my daughters moved out last weekend and my other daughter and son-in-law are moving out this weekend. And I'm just thinking, well, actually, it'll be a little bit calmer after that. And, you know, even when your children have left home and maybe mm. especially daughters, they're still on the phone to you a lot. I mean, my husband and I can sit down in the evening maybe to watch something on television and the phone will go and it'll be one of our daughters and we'll chat and hang up and then there'll be another daughter who phones <laughs> us. So, I mean, it's not like that every yeah. evening, but I, I'm not sure that I have more time really. So right. my days um, are higgledy-piggledy at the moment, but I'm hoping for calmer times because what I love is when I can get up and just write for the whole day if I want to. And those are my favourite days. Um, so, but I think I need to structure my days differently and that's what I'm trying to do so that I would write in the mornings till about two or three o'clock, um, maybe with a little break for lunch. And then after do something for me, because I'm very aware as well that time is pressing on 
And there's still lots I want to do. And for example, a friend might invite me for coffee and I'll say, no, I've got to write. And I think actually that's probably the wrong way to go about it. And I should be prioritizing a little bit more time for family and friends. So this is how I'd like my life to be, whether it will, and I this did decide that from January, it would be like that. So January hasn't been great. But I'm hoping <laughs> that from, from this, we're the first of them today. Um, and I'm just hoping that this will, is how my life will be, that I'll get up write for about I don't know four or five hours and then do something go for a walk see friends in the afternoon and to me that would be a perfect way of structuring right there is a sense with when you're and it's probably true also when you were self-employed with your language school that when you're self-employed you know and my daughter's my 24 year old daughter is here with me uh, living at home for a little bit as you said they do come back and um it is funny because she says, gosh, you work all the time. And it's true. Mm. There's, there's sort of this compulsion if you're not writing, because of course there's, we'd like to think that that's what we do. We write, but there's so much more of course to it. Mm. Right. I mean, you know, you're, there's always the editing another book or these that's kinds right. of conversations or a million other things that you have to do. So um, it is, it's hard because you love, of course you love the writing, but it isn't a perfect balance, is it? Um, and our, mm. our partners sometimes say, you know, are you down, you know, are you in that office again? <laughs> Do you want to come out for a while? So I completely understand that. Um, my husband well, says we can go on a 10 hour car journey and I won't speak to him for 10 hours because I'm just in my head, writing in my head, my next chapters or whatever. And, you know, now and again, I'm really conscious that I haven't said anything to him for ages. And I'll say, oh, um, you know, and I'll start speaking to him because I, but he's very good. He knows, he just knows that I'm right. He always says, oh, you're writing in your head. So I think, you know, we're lucky to have partners that just put up with the way we are. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, exactly. We, if you, I think that is the trick for, for writers. You have to have a really supportive um, mm -hmm. partner because it's a weird job and you it is a lot of time on your own and in your head, for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? I'm sure as, as every working writer, the moment you've got a book out, you're also, you know, neck deep in, in the next mm -hmm. thing. Can you talk about it or too soon? Yes. I have my deadline coming up quite soon. So, you know, it is a busy time trying to trying to get that book finished. Um, it basically is about a young woman. I can't say too much about it, of course, because I haven't finished it. So I'm not really sure where the story is going. Well, right. I know the end. I don't know the rest of it. But um, it's about a young woman who thinks she has a stalker. But again, she has a past. And, you know, is this stalker somebody from her past or is it somebody from her present? And uh, so yes, it's an, another book where there's a lot of things we don't know and people are keeping secrets from each other, which I think is always the foundation for a good thriller. I agree. And you know, one of the things I also love about, you know, your books and your characters is that nobody, there's nobody who's kind of perfect because I think, you know, we sort of understand that and then none of us is perfect, of course, anyway, but the idea that, you know, we all make little decisions that are maybe questionable, that in the moment seem like a smart decision, but then they sort of you know, they, they snowball and it's true even, you know, in them, in characters who are generally very good people, it's, I, you know, without giving anything away, what happens to Gabriel is a very good example of that. And it really just, it, these things, of course, like in real life, they start to sort of gain momentum. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. the, the sort of situation gets bigger and a little out of control. And um, mm -hmm. I love that because I feel like we can relate to those characters who make a bad choice but not mm. even that bad right you're doing it with the right intention and then all of a sudden it's a much much bigger problem than the one you started with so i love that i love that about um your book so that's fabulous well the next book sounds amazing this book is available um now and again if you haven't read i, I can't imagine is there anybody out there who hasn't read a ba paris book i can't even imagine but if you haven't um seven amazing books um and the guest is is no different bernadette i hope you this is a huge huge success for you like your other books and i can't wait to see what you do next thank you thank you very much everybody thank you so much for joining us today on killer women with ba paris and her latest thriller another page turner the guest we will see you next time bye bye